Hey guys, I hope this has been a helpful exploration of the spiritual discipline of lament. It's something we can all practice. It's all something we can learn. And if I'm honest, I'm, I feel like I'm learning this discipline for the first time. So I'm inviting you to learn with me. And as I'm seeing in the literature about lament, this practice will affect our relationship with God in a really good way, but it will also affect our relationship with with one another in a really good way. And the way that those things work, we're gonna talk about this word, it comes back to empathy. So believe it or not, we have an empathetic God, not just a sympathetic God, right? Not just a God that, you know, imagines what we're in and kind of feels it, but a God who experienced it for himself, a God who became human. So in a book I was reading about this topic, there's a chapter specifically about this, how the very nature of God shows us that he is indeed with us and he himself laments alongside of us. So let's read a little excerpt. This is from Scott Harrower in A Time for Sorrow. What is it about the Trinitarian nature of God that enables him to establish person-specific and communally mediated foundations for recovering from trauma? Is there a clear connection between God's nature and his work to establish what is required for recovery and trauma? Namely, a sense of safety, a coherent self-understanding, and reconnection to the community? Let me, let me try to repackage this a little bit. The Trinitarian nature of God, right? You guys know that God has revealed himself in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And the fact that there is within God this relational reality within himself, these three persons, remember what God the Son what Jesus Christ himself experienced. He experienced trauma. With that in mind, the fact that our God himself experienced trauma for himself, we know that there's something here about our connection with him and therefore our connection with one another that is going to be unlocked and fully understood when we approach him in our trauma through lament. Let me revisit Scott Harrower again to help make this a little clearer. When God's empathetic and person-specific knowledge is shared across people, one person with whom he indwells may receive specific insights about gifts of care for another individual or community that is suffering and lamenting. I think we've talked about this with prayer, right? That Jesus joins us in the prayers of the Bible, that, that the prayer book of the Bible, the Psalms, would have been Jesus's prayer book. This is an idea from, from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The man, the myth, the legend. This idea of God experiencing trauma for himself and then the spirit indwelling us, so he's, he's in our stuff with us, that not only is God person specific right he, he knows what you're going through and he relates to what it's like to be human even that in and of itself is like kind of blows my mind he's an empathetic god but it does something to us that when when we realize what god is doing with within us it changes the way we look at those around us and we become people of greater empathy that's kind of what this episode explores. When we realize his solidarity with us, we become in greater solidarity with one another. Empathy within God leads to empathy within the church. Have you thought about Jesus as someone who's lamented or laments? I mean, what is your picture of Jesus? Do you imagine Jesus... Like a, a crusading knight. Charge! What about a Jewish Jedi? These aren't the droids you're looking for. Do you imagine Jesus like you? Full of emotions 
and hardships that he faced. Have you thought about that? About just how human God the Son is. The laments of Jesus reach their crescendo in Matthew and Mark, and the cry of dereliction. Dereliction? 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 What's a... What is that word? Is it like a deer licking something? <laughs> no. Uh, it, it means to be abandoned. Jesus felt abandoned on the cross, right? That's what we're going to reference here in a second. On the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One can affirm that Jesus maintains his ultimate trust in God while simultaneously experiencing the anguish of human God forsakenness. Karl Barth brilliantly captures the theological intent of the cry of dereliction. This is what Karl Barth said. But the self-humiliation of God in his son is genuine and actual, and therefore there is no reservation in respect of his solidarity with us. He did become, and this is a presupposition of all that follows, the brother of man, threatened with man, harassed and assaulted with him, with him in the stream which hurries downward to the abyss, hastening with him to death, to the cessation of being, and nothingness. With him, he cries, knowing far better than any other how much reason there is to cry. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Deus pro nobis. What? It means God for us. I had to look that up, and I had to look up how to pronounce it, and I'm not really sure I'm doing it right. I don't know much Latin. But it means God is for us, right? He, he, he really is for us. He's really with us and he really understands. It means simply that God has not abandoned the world and man in the unlimited need of his situation, but that he willed to bear this need as his own, that he took it upon himself, and that he cries with man in this need. So this is indeed a God, God the Son. Jesus Christ, who knows what it feels like to be God forsaken, right? Last episode, we looked at this concept of the sleeping God motif, this feeling that, God, where are you at? Do you see my struggles? And here, this language quoted from the Psalms, quoted from a song of lament. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's not just a theological ascent or... I get you, it's sympathy, right? Uh, I, I, I could imagine what it's like to suffer. I could, I, I, I'm, I'm with you, I'm gonna say the words of the psalm, but I'm, I'm not gonna experience the alienation of the psalmist. That's not Jesus. Jesus felt it. Jesus was there. Jesus suffered. Jesus is with you. The God who is being prayed to by people who feel alienated from him, is the same God who experienced that alienation for himself. God the Son understands where you are. Jesus is with you. And Jesus is for you. Deus pronobis. So before we go any further, I just want to realize that, that, that when we trust in our God, we're trusting in a God with our prayers of brokenness and the things that are bothering us and the things that we're lamenting, we know that he's experienced the human condition. He's in solidarity. So when we become more aware of God's empathy in our prayer life and in our hearts, and as we become closer to God in our spiritual growth through spiritual practice, spiritual discipline, through prayer, something happens. Our hearts become more like God's. We grow in our empathy. And there's an increase in our solidarity with those who are suffering. We too can come alongside those who are suffering with greater empathy and the kind of costly solidarity that Jesus himself demonstrated. As we're thinking about this in our relationship with God, and we've focused on that for the first two episodes, and as we're going to pivot here. If we're with God, the empathizing God, who's in costly solidarity with humanity, we're going to find ourselves caring more and more and more about those who are hurting. Could you take a moment to just jot down 
anybody that you know, it could be directly an individual in your life who is hurting and who is lamenting something. Someone for which you are at least aware that you need more empathy with and for. Then could you also take a moment, and this may be a group of people or someone you don't know but you've heard about that has a great cause to lament in the season we find ourselves in. Think of some populations who are lamenting. Here's a few things that came to my mind. People who have lost family members to COVID-19. People who are struggling with mental health because of the isolation and the lack of social structures that are not continuing as normal at the moment. People who feel marginalized by virtue of their ethnicity, a conversation we've been participating in uh, for, for quite a while now, and that's still there, right? So this solidarity, uh, as, as, as we are, are, are coming, as we're bringing our broken selves to a God who became broken for us, we start to see the broken ones and care for them and relate to them in a different way. Lament unlocks something about human relations. And it unlocks something about the way that we suffer with those who are suffering. What have you led with lament? Do you think that would change how you empathize with those who have hardship in their lives and how they express themselves? I think it would. And I don't think this just applies to individuals. But I think if we led with lament, if lament was something, if we grow our empathy as God uh, cultivates our heart in, in, in the reality of his empathy, and we start to see the brokenness around us, we might see whole populations that we would approach differently, born out of the character change that lament offers when we go to God as co-sufferers with Christ and co-sufferers with one another. Uh, since we've touched on this conversation a bit with our look at the the prophet of Amos and, and how uh, there is this concern for those who are, who are mistreated in society that God has, we know that within the context of the American story, there has been a, a complex racial trauma that has played out. Uh, indigenous people were... Uh, given to genocide. African Americans were enslaved. Immigrants from different pockets of the globe have been demonized at different times in American history. And the church has admittedly a, a poor track record on, on being empathetic with those who are suffering from the triumphant narrative of the American dream. What if the conversation about racial reconciliation that we've only scratched the surface of, what if lament unlocked something in our hearts? The way that racial minorities experience this country is different than the way that the majority culture does. And maybe you're not completely aware of those debates but there has been a bit of a lack of empathy in the conversation at times. I, I feel like it's unavoidable to talk about with the discipline of lament as we're talking about unpacking our individual circumstances that we realize how it relates to others. I thought it'd be helpful to take a look at Mark Vrogop, who has written extensively on this topic in relating to uh, communities that are not the majority culture uh, within the life of the church. So here we go. Consider what it would look like if white brothers and sisters prioritized lamenting for minority Christians. What if lament prayers expressed our solidarity even when we don't fully understand? Imagine pastoral prayers or a brief lament on social media designed to communicate that we are weeping with those who weep. What if we led with lament even when we are not sure why some are weeping or even if they should be weeping? Do you see the, the heart posture of someone who has experienced and been shaped by the discipline of lament? It's a posture of empathy. For, for the young people, I don't know how aware you are of, of these debates, but for anybody 
who's a, an adult, these conversations have been unavoidable. And it's probably good that they've been unavoidable. And I just wonder what it would do to the conversation about how we relate to other people, other people groups, to disarm ourselves from defense, from pride, from politicization, and to walk in the tradition of Jesus, the tradition of costly solidarity, the tradition of lament. This weep with those who are weeping thing, that's from scripture. Don't forget, Jesus wept. Jesus knows tears. I thought it would be helpful to show you a lament and and, and, and to hear the lament of someone who represents a population who feels substantially mistreated within the context of American history. And so here is a prayer from an African-American pastor in Washington, D.C. Let's read it together. How long, O Lord, will you leave us in our blindness? Won't you open our eyes and our hearts to each other? The minds of your people are not renewed as they ought to be. We cling to the American cultural patterns and myths that ignore or deny the painful stories of others. We remain ignorant of the ways race and color have opened opportunity for some while closing it for others. We choose to reject the knowledge of these histories and injustices so that we might protect our own fragile identities and self-regard. We refuse to acknowledge the prejudice, bigotry, racism, and oppression that is obviously behind and before us. How long, O Lord, will you leave us in blindness? Father in heaven, enlighten the eyes of our understanding. Your church fails at times to live together in love and empathy. We fail to enter one another's shoes. We prefer the self-fulfilling prophecies of national narratives, the privilege of our protective cultures, the comfort of our cultural companions, the power of our political tribes. We count the risk of loving others too costly a gamble to make. How long, O oh Lord, before we practice the human and humanizing spiritual disciplines of sitting with and listening to each other? O oh Lord, the pain of our many rejections, the wounds of our many withdrawals, the isolation of our many suspicions have weakened our unity, our witness, and our love. But you love us, and you have promised to finish the work you began in us. You have destined us to be conformed to the image of your Son. Grant that the same love with which Christ loved us might be shared abundantly between Christians of every hue, history, culture, class, and language. O oh, great God of our Father, fill your household with Christ's redemptive love. I believe lament has the power to change this conversation. I believe lament has the power to change our hearts. I believe lament has the power to increase our empathy. And why would I say all of those things? Because I believe that God has lamented with us to draw us closer into his heart and to give us new eyes for those that are suffering as he had with us. He understands suffering because he walked through it himself. This train of thought applied to racial reconciliation can apply to many other issues that divide, that cause misunderstanding, that prevent us from having an empathetic view towards others. I want to challenge us to carry into these conversations, into our lives, into the way that we see and interact with the world, a deeper and broader sense of empathy. And if we refuse to lament, we might be refusing to meet God in the place where he can cultivate that very empathy. So if we have faith renewed by lament, uh, we could lead with lament. And, and what I mean by that is, is anybody that we approach that is suffering, we could have a greater sense of solidarity, a greater sense of understanding, and a greater sense of carrying the good news. If we led with lament, uh, when we approach brothers and sisters who are coping with loss, who are struggling with depression, who are feeling treated unfairly, we can join them in their brokenness because we know that's where God has joined us. 
And so there's this greater sense of solidarity with one another when we bring it all to God and acknowledge the brokenness. That'll never happen if we don't bring God our brokenness. It'll never happen if we don't lament. How can we grow in our empathy when we don't meet the empathizing God in our own brokenness? Christ lamented with us. Let us lament with him and let us lament with one another. And let us trust him enough to learn to lament together. Would we do that together? Would would we bring the brokenness not only of our own lives and our individual narratives, but bring the brokenness of the American story, bring the brokenness of our own community, and it's there that we actually, through lament, begin to understand one another at a deeper level. That's how God understands us through solidarity. Do you trust that God's with you in your brokenness? Do you trust that he experienced it himself? If you trust God in the brokenness, we can learn to trust one another in it too. If we would just acknowledge it. And all of these things, we're not afraid of leveling at God our complaint because we trust in him. Because lament is an act of trust. And it's an act of trust in God. But here's the thing, guys. It's actually an act of of trust in one another as well. That we could bear with one another our brokennesses. And if we're ill attuned to hear lament and the brokenness and the trauma and the tragedies of other people, we're gonna miss their solidarity with God. So let us grow in our empathy. Let us grow in our relationships. I believe lament as an act of prayer can grow our relationship with God and grow our relationship with one another. Let us lament together all of the brokenness we've been through, all of the brokenness that is littered throughout our challenging histories because we know that God will meet us there in our brokenness. And when we draw close to God, we find ourselves closer to one another.